My name is Alex Kotowski, and I am a, a social psychologist and a journalist, a researcher. I'm currently <coughs> interested uh, in serendipity because serendipity is an incredibly valuable uh, and fascinating experience. It's, it's all about delight. It's all about discovery. It's all about finding something completely unexpected that will take you off in a totally new direction. Um, people often talk about serendipity with reference to uh, discoveries. Recently, uh, they, they argued that the rocket is a serendipitous discovery. People also talk about penicillin, the chocolate chip cookie, Vaseline, Velcro, all different kinds of scientific discoveries that take people in completely different and delightful and incredibly valuable directions. And I became interested <clears throat> in serendipity, not just because it's important for the corporate bottom line, uh, but also for our social progress in terms of science, um, but also because it's important for the navigation of online content. We now are living in a ocean of information that is available online. How on earth do we navigate it? Most of us, of course, navigate it through the wonders of Google. I got interested in it, though, when I was traveling around the world and I was speaking with a variety of online pundits, and the thing that kept bubbling up to the surface was this debate about filtration. There, on the one hand, there were people like Stephen Johnson, the author of Everything Bad is Good for You and How to Be Creative, um, or something that his second book is basically about how to be creative. Uh, and Stephen says that the web is the ultimate serendipity engine because you can go onto Wikipedia and you can start by looking at Britney Spears and next thing you know you're looking at monarch butterflies and oh my goodness your life has changed because you suddenly know everything you need to know about monarch butterflies. On the other hand were debates between people like Douglas Rushkoff, who's, a, who's an author, uh, people like Eli Pariser, the author of The Filter Bubble, and, um, and Ethan Zuckerman, who's at Harvard Berkman Center, who were saying that because of the structure of the web and the way that the algorithms are working online, in fact, what's happening is that our attention and our knowledge is being filtered into smaller and smaller silos of information that we have access to that we're interested in because of this ultimate impersonalization. I then expanded this out because I'm, I'm at the moment, the research that I'm doing um, at the LSE is looking at how technologists kind of clean up the messiness of human beings out of necessity because, of course, what we're dealing with when we're dealing with the web is we're dealing with a technology that requires us to be ones and zeros. So what are the assumptions? What are the constructions of human beings? What are the filters that technologists are creating for us as human beings when they clean us up? The assumptions that they make about things like relevance and value which ultimately is what a system like Google wants to be and wants to do. Um, predicting serendipity is problematic. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that people haven't been trying to predict serendipity for a long time. I adore this. This comes from, uh, from this cybernetic serendipity manual um, or annual that, that came out in the 60s. It's the most fantastic blueprint for a, a, a thing that will predict serendipity. Of course, serendipity being a happy accident, the, uh, the important word here is, of course, accident is impossible to predict. It's anathema to the idea of serendipity. However, people like Google are interested in predicting serendipity. Eric Schmidt came out, I believe it was in 2010, and said that he hoped that Google would be the ultimate serendipity engine. And I thought, oh, I came up with that phrase first. Oh, but you've got a bigger platform than I do. So I let him have it. Um, my, yeah, I know, I'm good like that. What, as I, as I started to unpick what it was that he meant, however, is the idea of creating a serendipity engine for a search engine like Google is to take all of the information that this incredibly powerful resource has and has scraped and has collected and has gathered about us and then produce something that out the other side will be delightful, yes, and will be some kind of confluence of information that we may not have expected, yes, but is ultimately what we ourselves have put into the machine. And of course, in psychology, when we look at uh, statistics and we look at analyses, we do talk about things like rubbish in, rubbish out. There are things, of course, that Google doesn't yet know about us. Um, there are things that we keep to ourselves from the system. And so I decided that what I would do is I would try and reverse engineer Google 
It was kind of fun, actually. Um, the first thing that I did was I bought a suitcase, and I decided that I would stick Google into a suitcase because, hey, it's portable. It doesn't actually need to be physically based anywhere. Um, and then I started to pull apart this idea of what serendipity is. As I mentioned, people have been trying to predict serendipity for a long time for their own ends. And so there's actually quite a lot of research. Most of it comes from the psychological sciences, from the social sciences, uh, from anthropology. <clears throat> there's not so much in artificial intelligence. There's not so much in computer science. And there's not so much in mathematics. Um, this tends to be more of a, oh, am I rustling? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's a fashion fail, folks. <coughs> There are three things, wow, hello, big tent. There are three things that are important in serendipity according to the research. And, and this is based upon um, a research project that's currently being funded by the EPSRC here in the UK. It's a, a, a three-year sandbox project looking at what serendipity is. The first, Google can totally do. Any technology can do this because of its extraordinary technological brain. And that is create the confluence of information. That is bringing stuff together, the accident. The second and the third bits, however, are the bits that Google can't do, at least not yet. And I, and I want to emphasize at this point that although this is, <clears throat> this is a, a, a critique of Google as a system, it's not a criticism of Google, nor is it a criticism of the people who are creating these fantastic systems. It's perhaps a call to arms to see if, in fact, we can start to incorporate some of these more human, messy elements into our systems so that they ultimately serve us and our needs better. So the second two elements are insight that this accident is valuable to us. Neither of those yet can be predicted. Thankfully, I'm a psychologist, and this is what we try and do. That's unfortunately why I know they're not very good at being predicted. So uh, my collaborator in the first instance was a woman named uh, Kat Jungnickel, Katrina Jungnickel, who's at Goldsmiths. And she's a maker. She's a sociologist and a maker. And she and I uh, serendipitously found somebody who was willing to give us lots and lots of technologies. And so we built, we re-engineered Google in a suitcase by putting lots of um, bolts and knobs and twisty things that you can see outside during your break. Um, and then I started in the second version, because that was more of a proof of concept. And that integrated various things, including your environmental context in which you're searching for something, or your physical context, your psychological context, your social context. There are certain elements of this that can be predi predicted by the machine, can be interpreted by the machine, but there are also other elements that can't. For example, did you wake up on the right side of the bed or the wrong side of the bed today? It's quite difficult for something to, uh, to drill down and identify uh, whether or not that is the case and whether or not you'll be open to a serendipitous experience. So um, for the second version, I started going a little bit more homeland. I discovered the most fantastic stuff I've ever seen, which is called Magic Whiteboard. I'm not being supported by them. I just absolutely love them. You basically, I, I just got it. It's an aside. You take it out of a roll, a whiteboard, and you stick it on your wall, and you can make anything a whiteboard. I definitely went homeland on this. And I started to think about the various things that are important in serendipity. Things like where you are, what's happening, what you're doing. Things like um, the political context. Is it an environment in which serendipity actually wants to happen or not? That it's encouraged or not? Uh, and as I began to drill down further and further, I started to actually become one of those people that I was trying to understand, which is somebody who reduces human beings into ones and zeros. I started to truly understand and recognize what the task at hand was in creating not just a search engine, but also a serendipity engine. So I took a step backwards, and although I developed my algorithms with my various filters and my various weightings and all of this, this kind of thing, I realized that in fact, what you needed to do was you needed to re-inject the human being back into the machine. And I will now explain to you how I did that. The build, by the way, um, I'm covered in scratches and scrapes, is outside, and as I mentioned, you can, get, you can have a go uh, during the break. And it lives in suitcases. The first thing that you do when you're, when you're using the serendipity engine and you're seeking your serendipity solution is you draw a circle in the box. The next thing that you do is you transform a squiggle into a picture. And the third thing that you do is you take a photograph of yourself. 
These three things are then imported or uploaded to Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And I don't know if you're familiar with Amazon's Mechanical Turk, but effectively what it is, is it's an, it's an incredibly intelligent artificial, artificial intelligence. It is um, people around the world to whom information that cannot yet be parsed by computers is formed out. Things like um, interpretations or value judgments, things like emotions, going back to the circle, going back to uh, the squiggle, the circle, is compared by somebody in uh, Timbuktu or somebody in Singapore or somebody in Peoria, Illinois, who for a small amount of money, $1.25, uh, they tell me, or they tell the machine, whether your circle compares with a Japanese Enso, which is apparently uh, a representation of grace and delight. The second thing is they, uh, they compare or they analyze or they judge your squiggle based upon its creativity. And here's a top tip, and I'm sorry to Charles Arthur who did this earlier. Um, if you want to be judged as creative, there are two things you should not put in there. Number one is a shark. Number two is a hat. Apparently they're the most common things, and Charles put a hat in earlier. Perhaps that's why he got low on the creativity scale. But, you know, there you go. Now you're... And then the third thing is when they're looking at your face, they're judging you on two things. Number one what they feel is your psychological well-being at that particular point, and also your physical attractiveness. Everything that's now gone into the engine that seems completely bizarre and, and elaborate and, and, and difficult to capture, all of these things are involved in developing insight or having insight and interpreting something as having value. I then ask you to identify yourself. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite misspelling of my name. Uh, A-L-K-E-S Krotusky, which is actually what the first time I went and uh, I went to Google uh, was what was put onto uh, my, my name tag. I'm very pleased that I come up first when you stick that into Google. <coughs> um, I then ask you to identify yourself with the information that a machine can read so that I can pull down keywords from the top three sites, biographical keywords of information that is specific to you. And then I start to ask more interpretative questions. I ask you for your Google Plus uh, username, your Facebook account name, your Twitter account, and I look at the last 10 status updates from that space to identify what is most relevant to you right now. Obviously, that could be different tomorrow. At the moment, there's a lot of tweeting from me about Zeitgeist and Big Tent because that's where I've been for the past couple of days. And that would be relevant for the attention that I pay to any kind of happy accident that may come along. But then I start to ask things like, okay, what, if you were to die tomorrow, what would be the last three things that you would wish to eat that you would want on a menu? What one song today because again, it could be different tomorrow. What one song today would you want to have with you on a desert island? What, if your father happened to be a parasitologist, as mine is, would his specialist subject be on mastermind if it wasn't his occupation? And that would be cameras. Um, and, you know, what was the most influential film of your life as a child. These are things that at the moment the system cannot yet parse, and these are very relative, these are very specific to human beings. And then I ask you to go over to the suitcase that has all the knobs and switches and the buttons and the dials, and it's quite a haptic sense. It's got a good sort of clunk to it. And the reason is, is because by making it physical, we're reminding ourselves that, in fact, this is a technology that, um, that has an interpretation. I have knowingly curated that sunshine is an important part of serendipity. I've also um, curated that there are various other things, like um, whether or not somebody has grit or tenacity because they, they touch something or not. In fact, there are seven scales uh, that are integrated into the machine, and they vary from things like psychological well-being, uh, social support mechanisms, and whether or not you have them. Um, they, if, your attention, your grit, um, how much head RAM you have, how much you can actually keep inside your head so that when you're making connections, you're able to, um, to draw connections between those connections so that you can then move forward and say, yes, of course, this is an important thing within my life and I can move forward with it. So in fact, it's the combination of the relevant material from your present, from your past, and from your past past, combined with a variety of psychological and social instruments that can, in some ways, predict serendipity. Oh, there's also logic puzzles as well. So that's a, that's a quickie for you. 
What comes out at the end, after you hit the I'm feeling serendipitous button, is a prescription. Now, unfortunately, I cannot give to you serendipity. I would love to, because if I did, then I could make millions, squillions, because there's a lot of people who are interested in it. But what I can do is I can give you an interpretation, a roadmap, based very much upon what it is that you fed the machine with, and also the variety of things that, according to the responses that you gave me, make you more or less inclined to attribute things to serendipity. If you, for example, score high on head RAM, that means you're able to make lots of connections between lots of different things because you can keep a lot of things in your head. That means that I will then occlude the things that you put into the machine in the first place to make it more difficult for you, but at the same time you may, you may be able to make more creative connections between this information. However, if you score low on head RAM or low on creativity, for example, then I'm going to make it much more obvious and you can make those connections yourself. Another aspect of serendipity that even those who propose that the web can be an incredibly powerful serendipity engine argue is that the location is really, really important. Um, Stephen Johnson even mentions that in order to be creative, you should stop what you're doing right now and you should go have a hot bath or go take a walk. These are not things necessarily that the machine can do. And so the prescription proposes that you go and sit in the back of a plane, you go have a hot bath, maybe you have a glass of wine, and you consider the keywords that come out the back. The serendipity engine, the, the purpose of the serendipity engine is really to explore what it, what it is and how it is that technologists are cleaning us up as human beings. Uh, there are certain elements, there are certain aspects, there are certain features of humanity that at the moment we cannot yet do, yet the machines uh, and the people who are developing the machines are proposing that in fact they can. To that end, I think it's important to be very critical of how these technologies are trying to construct us as human beings and to understand by perhaps not building crazy contraptions with potential health and safety um, problems, but to create an understanding and, and kind of reverse engineer in your head how it is that people who are developing these technologies are making assumptions about yourself. As with the last session, it's important to recognize that the power that developers, whether it's people who are creating filtration mechanisms or even those people who are involved in regulation have over our online experience is incredibly high. And we don't yet know, we haven't yet learned how important it is and how much of a disparity there is between the users and the developers yet. So thank you very much and please do come and try the Serendipity Engine. Do you want to come and have a, a seat, Alex? Um, and we'll do a couple of questions. Um, let me just put a point from Twitter to you, from Jeffrey McCaleb, McCaleb um, who may be in the room. But he says, creating an algorithm for serendipity sounds as plausible and fantastic uh, as predicting the outcome of chaos theory. Yes, I completely agree. Which is why um, I'm very reflexive in it. And I know that what, I, what I'm hoping to do with this is, while at the same time gathering lots of really, really interesting data, um, thank you very much in advance, uh, but while collecting really interesting data from this particular context is then taking it to, different, to other contexts around the world to see how, in fact, they interpret serendipity and what else may be interesting uh, to include in an algorithm. What, what will you, as a, as a user, what do you think you'll actually get beyond the personalization uh, and, uh, of, of social networks um, and what we get already on Facebook or Google Plus or, or Twitter from people we know or follow or whatever. Because a lot of that is serendipitous, isn't it? I, I wouldn't necessarily... I, I, I sit more on the side of, of, of Eli and, to an extent, Ethan, um, in which what we do when we surround ourselves uh, with like-minded people, which is very much what we do in these social network contexts, um, is we, um, we develop a kind of comfortable duvet of the information that, uh, that we like, that reinforces our own beliefs. Um, something like a serendipity engine or something that, that uh, forces you outside of those, those regular practices that introduces you to something that's completely accidental um, will open your eyes and open your mind to lots and lots of different things. The problem is, at the moment, what's happening is that we're filtering into them. Any questions? 
Yeah. <coughs> now, Alex, you said thank you for all that information we're giving you. Could you just clarify what permission you're asking for and what will you do with the personal information we give you? Yes. All of that information is locally saved and it will be, it will be used within the research that I'm doing. Um, I will not be selling it, forwarding it, um, putting it in a publicly accessible online format. Anyone else? <coughs> yes, at the back. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you mentioned that you felt that um, if you could predict serendipity, it would make you uh, rich and that there would be a big demand for it. What do you think the actual value to people of it is? What is it that it would give you in your daily life if... Um, you know, if there's a website you could go to and basically... My um, dad taught me that serendipity is when a man goes looking for a needle in a haystack and finds the farmer's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> love, love is one of, the <laughs> one of the things that does come out of serendipity, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, people talk about serendipity as life-changing experiences, whether it's changing jobs or um, seeing her across a crowded room or, or those different types of things. So what's been really interesting uh, over the past few days doing my user testing is that um, many people have different interpretations of what comes out of the machine. So um, one person said, nope, you know, I have no idea what on earth that means, but I could totally see how it could be the plot of, you know, the plot of a movie. And in fact, somebody said that earlier today. Um, somebody else said, oh my God, I can totally see how I could work that into a joke. And somebody else said, well, I, I have to rewrite my job description. I've just been tasked with rewriting my job description for the next year. Um, and I would, I'm just, you know, these seem to be interesting things that at least I can, I can make a starting point with and it may send me off in a different direction. Um, serendipity as value to society is this idea of creativity, is this idea of scientific, scientific discovery, et cetera. For the individual, it's very much about delight. JMKD on Twitter says, when you design for serendipity, isn't there a danger of de-serendipitizing? Absolutely, <laughs> completely. And that's why it, it really was fascinating to try and interpret the criticisms that I had in the, in the first variation of, of, this, of this machine, of this engine, and actually try and make something that had some kind of outcome. <laughs> the reason was, is because although the first one was just kind of the outcome was, hey, insight, man, cool people actually wanted something physical, and so I actually had to create an algorithm, <laughs> and I actually had to do what it was that, um, that the people who were designing systems do. But do you believe it is, that you, it is even possible? No, and that's why yeah. the, the outcome is open to interpretation by the person, not by me. Anyone else? Yes. Down here, and then, well, in fact, number four microphone's there first, so let's see if you and, and I think, actually, that's, that's ultimately the problem with the idea of creating a serendipity engine um, via a search engine or through a search engine, is that the search, the search result needs to be something that can be relevant and valuable right now. It's very directed versus something that, um, you know, you're not, gonna, you're not necessarily going to value Google as much if it says... Here you go, here's something that's completely unrelated. But you may find delightful and change your life in a totally different way. You go to Google very much for a specific purpose, which is to find information. Yes, and then down here. Hey, Alex, uh, <laughs> Dave Coppin from Microsoft. Two things, just wanted to remind everybody that other search engines are available. Other search <laughs> engines are available, absolutely. But, but, but I'd but also <laughs> like to thank Google for the support <laughs> for this project. What, 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 other sponsors are also available. Um, the main point, however. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> How you doing? The main point, however, is serendipity is one of those wonderful words that actually has lost its meaning mm -hmm. uh, as we've gone along in time. Its original meaning was actually that serendipity was two things, the happy accident that we talk about, but actually you have to add the happy accident to the sagacity, the wisdom, yes. to know what to do with it. That's the insight. Ah, okay, because that was what I was looking for in this, because yeah. a lot of this stuff is just about, I bumped into this guy, it was a happy accident. That's yeah. serendipity. No, th that was a happy accident. Absolutely, and that's, that tends to be where people stop, and that tends to be where people put the magic into the machine. So the idea of you know, putting something into a search, any search engine, a search engine, or, putting, you know, or tripping into Wikipedia and finding monarch butterflies, people then stop, or, or hearing a song and saying, ah, that did it, or seeing her across a crowded room, that did it. No, in fact... There are the other elements. It's the sagacity, as you say. It's the insight and the wisdom to recognize the value of the connection between being in the room and seeing somebody across it. Yes. Um, hello. Um, 
kind of related back to the de-serendipitizing <coughs> of things. So there's a, a big push to personalize search results um, across all the various search engines available. Um, and uh, what do you think the potential social impact or user experience impact is of over-personalization, which actually de-serendipitizes things? Well, in many ways, this is what Christian was asking before, which is the kind of the bubble. And this is what Eli describes, which is this, this filter bubble. Um, you become more and more focused on the tranche of information. So perhaps, you know, instead of having a personalized search experience where the top three are exactly what it is that are exactly for what it is that you're looking for, um, throw something completely left field in there and then we would have a kind of a, a weird wandering um, a discovery of stuff that's perhaps one or two degrees separated from what it was that you were searching for in the first place. I mean, I, I do have a concern with that, which is why I've, I've decided to embark on this crazy project, <laughs> is in fact what does happen if we just simply become embubbled in, um, in, our, in things that confirm our beliefs and our behaviors. On that note, thank you very much indeed, uh, Alex, for, for joining us. Thank you very much.